This video is about syntax. And a good way to start is just with a quick recap of the syntax that we know from sentential logic. So sentential logic, remember, is all about our five logical connectors. There they are. And when we did sentential logic, we actually learned a lot of sort of technical syntax. We learned the difference between an atomic and a molecular term. We learned about official notation, well-formed formulas. And of course, very importantly, we learned our informal notation rules, which include the hierarchy of connectives and the rightmost rule. At this point, these things are probably just very natural for you. And that's really important because all these things will carry forward into predicate logic. Now, just a quick recap, a well-formed formula in sentential logic is essentially either just an atomic, which is the sentence letter P through Z, or some sort of molecular sentence, where the molecular sentence is created by combining things with our logical connectives. So our binary connectives combine two things, and our uh, unary connective, which is the negation, just modifies a single thing. And so we know that this is how we build up uh, more complicated formulas, and this is how we make them well-formed. Of course, we relax the understanding of well-formed to include informal notation, because the definition of a well-formed formula is, strictly speaking, in official notation, but we're not too worried about that. So we have here, then, the symbols of single-place predicate logic, and we also know the rules about syntax and well-formed formulas and so on. And so what we need to do is we need to add the things we need for predicate logic. So from the previous video, we know that we need the quantifiers, which are the upside down A for the universal, and the backwards E for the existential. We need the letters that allow us to pick out uh, individuals, so name letters, and this is lowercase a through h. We also need variable letters, which are very important when we pair them with quantifiers, so that we can talk about generic quantities of things, and we use the letters i through z, lowercase. And we also have to have our predicate letters, capital A through O. And the predicate letters are what allow us to bestow properties on our uh, subjects, which are either names or some sort of variable and so on. OK, so this is the basics of the symbols. What we now need to do is develop our syntax and all our vocabulary so we know how to build sentences in predicate logic. I want to warn you that this is a somewhat technical video. There are technical details ahead uh, at a level that I haven't really done in the past. And part of the reason is because logic is technical. So this course and the sort of notation and all the sort of system of logic that we're doing comes from this logic textbook by Kalis Montague Omar. And uh, it has sort of like a long history and legacy in logic. Uh, if you've ever tried to read it, it's hard to read because it is so technical. But some people really like learning in a technical way. And so if you're one of those people, well, this video is for you. But if you're not one of those people, don't worry about it. I still want you to go through this video and know that really, for you, the best way to learn these things is actually by doing and by practice. And I'll try and sort of have these key takeaways and, and sum up some of the important facts as we go. But you don't really need to know and have at your command all these technical details to learn how to do the problems. And once you do more of these practice problems and start sort of just like naturally understanding what's going on, the technical details won't seem so daunting anymore. So don't worry about it if this seems overly technical. It's, it's not a problem moving forward. Our goal is to understand the new formulas that we'll be able to symbolize in predicate logic. And to do that, we are actually going to start at the very sort of small, basic building block, which we call a term. So a term is the most basic formula out there. And a term is just a name letter or a variable letter. So it's A through H or I through Z. And an atomic formula is the smallest building block of any of our formulas. And we're going to use terms to build them. Now, don't forget, everything from sentential logic still applies. So the atomic sentence letters P through Z, which are statements, uh, that can be true or false, they are still atomic formulas. But what we're going to add to this is that we have a new type of atomic formula, which is some sort of predicate letter, capital letter A through O, followed by a term. And remember, a term is just a name letter or a variable letter. So here are some basic examples of atomic formulas in predicate logic. F, A. That's OK, because F, capital F, is a predicate. And it's followed by a term, which in this case is the name letter A. GX, same story. It's just that this time, it's not a name letter. It's a variable letter X. Notice that Q, there's nothing suspicious about Q. 
because Q is one of our atomic sentence letters, capital P through Z, so that is also atomic. And capital B, lowercase i, that's just like the uh, sort of uh, other examples that we looked at at the beginning here. And here are some examples of things that are not atomic formulas. They have problems. The first one is capital A. That's just a predicate letter. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. it's not followed by a term, so it's not an atomic formula. The next one is two predicate letters next to each other. Well, that's not an atomic formula, obviously, as well. Uh, the third one, capital S, lowercase a, that actually looks okay, except there's a problem. Capital S is not a predicate letter. Capital S is an atomic sentence letter, P through Z, so you can't have an atomic sentence letter followed by uh, anything, really. That doesn't make sense. Uh, and the last thing is just C. It's a term on its own. That's not an atomic formula either. We never write just a name or a variable on its own. From there, we can build up molecular formulas. So remember that molecular formulas, all the sentential stuff applies. So we can build up molecular formulas by from taking these atomic formulas and combining them or building bigger things using uh, the logical connectives. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but what we're also going to introduce is a new kind of formula, which is a quantified formula. So it says here, if phi is a formula and alpha is a variable, then the following are quantified formulas. For all alpha phi, and there exists alpha phi. So what this is telling you is that the correct syntax for using a quantifier, the universal or the existential, is it always has to be followed by a variable, and then after that, we have our formula in question, be it, be, it can be atomic or it can be molecular, and that's how we use quantification. We always need a variable after the quantifier. Now that we know these things, we can define a well-formed formula very easily. Something is a well-formed formula if it's atomic, molecular, or a quantified formula, just like we have defined it in the previous several slides. And this is a pretty straightforward way of understanding what we mean by well-formed. So rarely am I going to talk about uh, a, a quantified formula or molecular. What we generally care about is whether or not something is well-formed, which is to say it follows these basic syntactical rules. You should notice, just like before, that a well-formed formula is going to be in official notation. That is, that every binary connective has parentheses around it. Uh, but we're just going to make the same convenient modification that we made in sentential logic, which is to say that a well-formed formula that is in informal notation, follows the informal notation rules, is also well-formed. So I'm just not going to stress about this too much. I will call informal uh, statements uh, well-formed, even though, technically speaking, uh, they may not be. We do need a, an important new concept here, which is, again, reflective of concepts we already know. Uh, we need the con the, to understand what a main operator is. So we know what a main connective is, and we know that we have five logical connectives. But what we've actually added to our system are these two important symbols, the upside down A and the backwards E, the universal and the existential. And so they're not connectives. They're actually called operators. And technically speaking, our logical connectives are also operators. They're just sort of like a special subclass of them. So all of these things are operators. And so we're going to talk about main operators moving forward. So an easy way to think about this is in virtue of something called a subformula. We can say phi is a subformula if it is being operated on. So that is to say, some it is part of a sort of formula where we have these uh, operators that are sort of doing something. Uh, we, you know, this will be more clear when we look at some examples. But the main operator then is just the operator that is not part of any subformula. This is a really sort of like technical way of understanding a main operator, but there's a really sort of like casual, easy way of thinking about it too. The main operator is the main thing in the sentence. It's either a quantifier or it's one of the connectives, or if there's nothing, it just means that there's no main operator and we're looking at an atomic statement. Uh, so the main operator really fits with your sort of understanding of what a main connective is. We're just adding two things, the universal and the existential. I think that the easiest way to really make sense of a lot of this syntax is by looking at sort of bad examples, so not well-formed examples and spotting mistakes, and then sort of we can talk about some good examples after. So here's an example of a not well-formed uh, statement or formula, AXGY biconditional Q. So there's nothing wrong with the biconditional Q, but the AXGY is problematic. Uh, we know that AX 
is a uh, atomic formula on its own, GY is as well, but we can't build something with two atomic formulas without something in between. So we actually need something there, some sort of connected like and or or, and then we could fix this formula. Here's another example for all x, dx and r or negation, there exists a y, bracket gy. So there's actually several problems with this. See if you can spot them. Uh, the first problem that I'm going to point out is that we have at the same level an and and an or. Uh, and we can't have that. We know from sentential logic that that's ambiguous, so we would need to fix that. But there's another sort of uh, minor problem here, uh, which uh, it, it's minor in a sense, it still makes it wrong, which is around the gy in this example, I have these per, uh, parentheses. So I have there exists a y bracket gy bracket. And we don't have that. Remember, the only time we can really add parentheses uh, is when we have a binary connective. We never put a parentheses around an atomic. So in sentential logic, we would never have P with parentheses around them. But GY here is also an atomic in our language, so we never have parentheses around those either. Negation, capital N, A, and it's not the case, bracket, there exists a Y, F, B. Uh, here, everything seems okay, but the problem is those parentheses just like before. Remember, in sentential logic, if I had the negation of Q, I would never write negation brackets Q. Uh, we would always just leave the parentheses out because, just like I said a moment ago, you only have those things when we have a binary connective. So the problem here is you can't have that. This is important because lots of people think at first that when you have a quantified formula, you are allowed to put parentheses around it uh, and just sort of treat it as a, a sort of a thing that you can modify with parentheses and so on, but it turns out that you don't want to do that. So that's not well formed. Uh, a of A, biconditional, B, negation B. This problem is actually sort of something we've looked at in a previous video. The problem is that you cannot have a logical connective inside of a predicate, in the slot or the place of a predicate. So that negation can't be there. You can only have a term, and the term is defined as a name letter or a variable letter. For all D, bracket FD, arrow G, and B. Uh, again, uh, so what's going on? There's a couple mistakes here. The first mistake is that uh, we can't have D be paired with our quantifier. So we know that our quantifier needs to be paired with a letter, but remember it has to be paired with a variable letter, and a variable letter is lowercase i through z. So that letter d is a name letter, we can't have that. Uh, we also have the mistake that we have a predicate letter g on its own, that needs some sort of term in its place or slot. And the last mistake is we have a term letter on its own, and we know we can't do that, we need to make an atomic formula out of that by putting it in some sort of predicate. Okay, last example. For all x, bracket, there exists a y, bracket, f, d, x, arrow, a, bracket, y. Again, a lot of mistakes here that we've seen. The first is that we can't have these parentheses around that existential. We don't put parentheses around quantified formulas, just around things with binary connectives. Here we have sort of something funny. I have two uh, things that belong to the f predicate. Now, in multi-place predicate, that might be okay. But remember that we're dealing with single pred place predicate, so we can't do that here. We can only have a single thing there. And the last thing is that we have these parentheses around the y that is uh, the sort of in the slot or in the place of the predicate capital A, and we don't do that either. Parentheses don't go inside uh, a predicate in single place predicate logic. Well formed examples. It's not that exciting because they will just sort of look natural and correct, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go quickly through and show you what the main operator is on all of these statements. So here, these are all similar to the slide before, just fixed. Uh, how do I figure out what the main operator is? Well, it's either the disjunction or the biconditional, but we know from informal notation that it's got to be the biconditional through the hierarchy of connectives. Here's another example. Uh, here we have a quantifier. We also have a, a conditional and the disjunction. Notice that the conditional cannot be the main operator because it is clearly in the parentheses being operated on by the universal quantifier. But notice that the universal and the disjunction seem to be at the same level. Um, and in this case, 
where it's actually the disjunction that's going to modify. So this is an important sort of add-on to our hierarchy of connectives. The quantifiers uh, sort of relate to the things that they are uh, modifying on the parentheses. This is called scope, and scope is something we're going to go into a lot of detail soon. Uh, what about this one? This should be pretty straightforward. Notice that I have those parentheses there. The negation on the outside is modifying everything, so it's got to be the negation. Uh, another example, uh, a bunch of connectives here. You can see it can't be the biconditional because the biconditional is at a really sort of low level, but then I have these two conjunctions in a row, so we apply the rightmost rule and it's the right conjunction. Here's our last example. For all x, fx, arrow, gx, and hb. In this case, we have the conditional, we also have the conjunction, but we have the universal quantifier, and you can see that the universal quantifier is at a higher level because of the parentheses, so the universal is the main operator in this example. An important concept that I mentioned in the previous slide about identifying the main operator is this idea of scope, quantifier scope. And this is a very important concept that will help us in symbolizing, and it's something we really need to sort of become really comfortable with. We're going to look at it throughout a lot of videos about what scope lets us do. It's not that complicated in a technical sense. The scope of a quantifier is the subformula of which the quantifier operates on. So when I have a sort of an abstract representation, if I have uh, for all alpha phi, the scope of the universal quantifier in that sense is the subformula phi. So it's just whatever phi is. Same thing with there exists the, or the existential alpha phi, it's the same. So on the right two examples, those are also sort of just another sort of abstract representation. What I mean when I say the scope of quantifier is whatever it's operating on inside of the parentheses right after the quantifier. Now, sometimes there is no parentheses, and that just means that it's operating on the individual predicate right after it, and that's okay. That just means the scope is the thing that's right immediately after it. So here's an example of some sort of complex sentence, and we can ask what the scope is and what the main operators are. So the first thing I want to do is I want to sort of take a moment and spot what the main operator is. So we can see that uh, the, it's got to be the conjunction because everything else is sort of on a lower level. But the only reason I know that is because I know what quantifier scope is. So let's look at the universal on the left. What is that universal modifying? Well, according to quantifier scope, it's the subformula which it operates on by these rules. So I can see that I have an open bracket immediately after the universal quantifier and I just have to find where it closes off, where the scope ends. And so if you take a close look, even though I have some sort of other complicated thing going on there, what's underlined in green is the main formula, the subformula that is being modified by the for all x. And so that's what the scope of that quantifier is. And now I can go down the line and sort of see the scope of every single quantifier. For the existential y, I also have those parentheses which are holding together the G, Y, biconditional Z, and so that is also its own sort of scope. And finally, for the there exists X, A, X, notice that there are no parentheses there, which means that the subformula is just that little atomic right there, which is A, X. So scope is an important concept in just helping us understand what a quantifier is modifying, and like I said, it's going to be very important moving forward. Another really important concept is the difference between a free and a bound variable. So notice that a quantifier always has to have a variable right after it. That's why uh, I've been expressing it as for all alpha, or there exists alpha, where alpha is a variable letter i through z. And so what a quantifier is doing is it's binding variables to it. And so what we're going to say is that a quantifier binds an occurrence of a variable, if and only if, that occurrence is within the scope of the quantifier that we're talking about, so it's got to be modified in the subformula of that quantifier. That occurrence is also the same variable letter as the quantifier variable letter. So if I have for all x, that only binds other occurrences of the letter x. And that occurrence is not already bound by a different quantifier in the sense defined above. Now this last technical clause doesn't come up too often in single-place predicate logic, but it will come up a lot in multi-place. So we're going to revisit uh, this uh, a definition of a free and a bound variable when we 
look at multiplace and focus a little bit more on this last bullet. Okay, so what is a bound variable and what's a free variable? An occurrence of a variable is bound if it is in the scope of a quantifier with matching variable letter, and we'll just say if it's free if it's not bound. These are the technical definitions. The actual in practice of this is pretty straightforward. So if you didn't like the technical definitions, we're just going to look at a couple examples that will hopefully make it very clear. So let's look at some examples of a free variable. Over here we have there exists an x, fx, and gy. Uh, the x after the capital letter F is not a problem. Notice that that is in the scope of a quantifier, there, the, there exists an x, and the letters match. They're both x's, so no problem. That one is good, that is bound. But when we look at the gy, notice that y is a variable letter, i through z, and y, even though it's in the scope of a quantifier, there exists an x, notice that they don't match. The y does not match with the letter x, so that's why that is a, an example of a free variable. So how do I make it bound? Well, it's pretty straightforward. One way I could make it bound is I could just change that y to be an x to match up. So they got to be the same letter if I wanted it to be bound. Uh, here's another example, for all z, f, z, biconditional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, notice that the for all z, f, z, there's no problem with that. The f, z is bound, is under the scope of the universal z, and the z's match together. So what about the right side of the biconditional? Well, there I have actually this uh, sort of quantifier that is operating on the entire right side. That's the existential x. Then I have gx. Again, no problem. But then later down, you can see I have this fz. And of course, that z letter doesn't match. So that's why that z is free. All the other variables are OK. How do I make it bound? Uh, again, just like above, it's not that exciting. I just change the letters to match. So we'll cruise through the last couple examples. Uh, this uh, example here is a little different. On the left side of the disjunction, I have the g of x, and that's free because there's no quantifier. There's no for all x, and there's no there exists a y. Sorry, there's no existential x uh, that is binding that variable down. So g of x is free. Specifically, the x in the g of x is free on the left, and so that's no good. Uh, I'm not going to bother fixing these last two. It's pretty straightforward. So here I have another example where I do have the quantifier for all x, and I have another quantifier, there exists a y. Uh, but notice at the end, I have this a y. Now, earlier on, I do have the quantifier with the y variable, the existential quantifier with the y. But notice that the parentheses there are closing the scope of that existential y before I get to the a y. So that's why the a y is actually a free variable. Again, I mean the y is the free variable attached to the a, uh, and we would have to fix that. Now I keep saying that we have to fix it, uh, which is sort of implying, also by my color scheme here, that there's something wrong with free variables, and that's true. We're going to define a sentence as a well-formed formula that has no free variables. If you've been paying really close attention, uh, you may have noticed that a well-formed formula can, by definition, contain free variables. There's nothing wrong with that in terms of its well-formedness. But we're going to develop a new sort of like terminology, which is a sentence, and a sentence is a special subset of well-formed formulas where everything is bound. Every variable letter is bound. And this is going to be really important for us for symbolization because sentences can have truth values, and sentences, therefore, can have meaning. And so what we're going to be trying to do all the time when we symbolize is symbolize sentences, not just well-formed formulas. We want to write down sentences. So in this context, free variables are bad. We don't want anything that contains free variables. This is sort of um, complicated because we've looked through a lot of different ways of writing essentially strings of symbols. So I'm going to try and break it down in a sort of very basic way. So what we have are sort of subsets of one another. We can have strings of symbols, and then we can have special strings of symbols, which we call well-formed formulas, and then we have special well-formed formulas, which we call sentences. And if you have a string of symbols, they can be the correct symbols of our language. But if you have a string of symbols and it's not well-formed, it's essentially just gibberish. It's like writing out a word in English with all the letters that's not actually a word or doesn't follow any of the grammatical sort of like rules. It's just gibberish.
If you write out a well-formed formula, what you've done is you've taken symbols and you've put in them in a syntactically correct way. It just so happens that if it's not a sentence, though, it doesn't actually have any meaning to it. It just looks syntactically correct. So finally, when we talk about sentences, these things are well-formed formulas of strings of symbols, and they can have meaning. So that's why sentences are what matter. Here's another sort of quick recap of everything that we've done. Uh, we started with the basics of our system. We defined a term and these formulas, atomic, molecular, and quantified. But the point of all this was that when you put these things together, we arrive at well-formed formulas. That's what we wanted to do. We also had to sort of understand our quantifiers a bit better. And so we have quantifier scope. And the concept of quantifier scope allowed us to understand the difference between a free variable and a bound variable. And when you put a bound variable with a well-formed formula, you get a sentence. Now, I want to be a bit careful here, but I also don't want to worry about this too much. What's the difference between a sentence and a statement? You might recall that a statement is a special type of sentence that has a truth value. So are, is it the case that all statements are sentences in predicate logic? Uh, the answer is sort of complicated. The answer is not quite. And for us to understand this, we really need a semantics of predicate logic, which we're not going to develop till later. So for now, I'm just going to have to pause on this question and not really answer it in great detail. So what I'm going to say, though, is that there's a lot of precision in the language out there between a term, a formula, a well-formed formula, a sentence, and a statement. And I've been very precise in this video. But in reality, when we're actually moving forward and just symbolizing, even though what we're going for is sentences, you'll see that everyone starts loosening up on their language. And even in sort of uh, textbooks and so on, you'll see people just talk about formulas or talk about well-formed formulas when they really mean sentences. Or they'll say sentence, but they're not differentiating between statements. And we're probably just going to do the same thing. So even though I've been very technical in building up our language, in the end, when we're symbolizing, even though our goal is to symbolize sentence, if you call it a well-formed formula, that's totally okay. And if you just call it a formula, that's also totally okay. As long as we sort of just know what it is our goal. Our goal is a syntactically correct statement, or, or sorry, string of symbols, and then uh, such that we have no free variables. That's our goal. And the precision of the language, we're not going to stress about too much moving forward. Okay, so the recap, we learned all this technical stuff. Uh, the really important concepts are here. Main operator, scope, these are really, really big ones. But a really other important thing to take away from this is if this video was overwhelming because it was very technical, it doesn't really matter. We're going to learn a lot by doing. And then once you sort of really internalize a lot of these things, you can come back and take a look at this and be like, oh, yeah, this actually makes sense. It's not so bad. So what's next? We're actually going to start symbolizing with quantifiers now that we know the syntactical rules of our system.